Hey everyone, uh, my name is David. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm going to be talking with you about Akka and how it can be a best friend forever uh, for your back end for front end. Just, Alejandro just stole my joke there. Um, we also call this a BFF, it's a little easier to say. If you have never heard of a BFF, uh, don't worry, we're going to go through uh, what we mean by, by that as well. So before we get started, uh, I want to give credit to my whole team. Um, I work on the core team at PagerDuty, and so do these fine people up here. We work on all of our projects together, so it's just, you know, I'm the lucky or unlucky guy to be standing up here. So uh, what are we really talking about? Here is the plan. First, I'm going to describe the BFF pattern and what it looks like at PagerDuty. Uh, then we'll talk about using Akka HTTP for proxying requests. After that, we'll talk about using Akka streams to enable live updating of our UIs. And finally, I'll share some results from uh, deploying our code to production. So let's see a show of hands. How many people have heard of the BFF pattern? Okay, a fair number of people. Um, how, ma how many of you have never heard about it before at all? Okay, so this is good. We're going to learn some stuff. Um, this is a diagram of how BFFs might fit into a sort of typical microservices architecture. Uh, in this diagram, we have three BFFs shown, and each BFF receives requests and routes them appropriately to a backend service. So uh, let's take an example uh, of an online store. Let's say we have a service that has our user, user profile data, uh, so requests for that profile would go to that service. Likewise, requests for the user's shopping cart might go to another backend service. Each BFF can route these requests appropriately. Now, some of you might be thinking, uh, okay, BFFs are all about routing to microservices. This is a fancy new word for an API gateway. And why do we have three? For contrast, uh, here's what the diagram looks like with what I would call an API gateway. It's a single service that serves all types of clients. So the difference between these two diagrams can be really summed up in one word, and that's focus. Uh, BFFs are really about focusing on a specific user experience or a specific front end. So you saw that there were three BFFs in the previous slide, and that's because there were three user experiences, mobile, website, and developer API. Each of those front ends has different needs. So if we take the mobile example, you have a smaller screen and probably less data is going to be displayed. Now, it's wasteful to send data over the wire that is actually never used. Mobile clients in particular you know, have limited bandwidth, uh, limited power, so we want to make sure that we're not doing anything we don't need to do. A mobile BFF might transform responses to remove unnecessary data that is not displayed on the screen. So without a BFF, you have two options. You end up putting that sort of front-end specific logic uh, into each back-end service itself, or uh, you sort of cram the logic for all of the front-ends into one API gateway. In my opinion, neither are great ideas. Uh, the first one, you sort of spread knowledge about your front-ends across all of your back-end services, while the other, uh, you put a bunch of unrelated concerns, you know, unrelated uh, logic for different front ends uh, into one place. BFFs really allow us to encapsulate all that front end specific stuff uh, while maintaining focus. So what we're really trying to do here is not violate a single responsibility principle. So I just mentioned routing and response transformation, but there are many other things that you might want to do with a, a BFF. Now, some of these are a bit more controversial, um, and this being a relatively new pattern, you know, there's lots of opinions floating around, so don't just you know, take my word for it. Um, but we can take some examples here. So API aggregation. Uh, maybe you have a developer API that combines data from multiple backend services. If we go back to our example of, of the online store, uh, say the user API includes the user's shopping cart data. So how do you put that data together? Well, one answer might be making parallel calls to those separate services from the BFF and then aggregating the responses into a single API response to the user. Or take 
authentication. Developers of these backends, you know, they care about authentication. They want to know who their user is, but they don't necessarily want to write code for it. And even if they do want to write code for it, there's a good chance that eventually somebody somewhere is going to get it wrong, and that's a bad thing. So you can push that sort of generic edge concern into the BFF layer and make it easy for backend developers to concentrate on their features uh, without worrying about how authentication is done. It's the same thing for like rate limiting. It's a generic concern. Uh, it just needs to be done, but it shouldn't be done by everyone in different ways in different places. Now, what about uh, live UIs? When I say live UIs or liveness or live updating, what I'm talking about is the ability of an interface to automatically reflect up-to-date information uh, from the user. Or, sorry, up-to-date information without intervention from the user. So on a website, you know, you don't have to hit refresh. You don't have to swipe down on a mobile app uh, just to see new data. Well, different front ends have different liveness requirements as well. The example from previously uh, still applies. Mobile needs less live data than a website, maybe. So is there a way that we could use a BFF to actually customize a live user experience? Well, we're going to find out. So uh, given that you can do many things with a BFF, I would like to share a bit about what it, mean, what it has meant for PagerDuty uh, over the last couple of years. What is on this slide? Anyone? Just shout it out. It's a monolith. So uh, PagerDuty, like many other companies, started with a monolithic Ruby on Rails application. Over time, we've outgrown it. Um, we have embraced microservices while trying to put less code into the monolith. It can be difficult to entirely get rid of a monolith, though. By definition, it's a very large piece of software. It probably plays uh, some very crucial roles in the operation of your system. You can't just you know, split it into 100 microservices all at once and, and delete the GitHub repo. Instead, what you end up doing is you chip small pieces off uh, the monolith where it makes sense. You break down the monolith gradually. And we actually saw this yesterday uh, in one of the talks. This means that your monolith and your microservices will coexist for quite a while. And some traffic will continue to go to the monolith, while other traffic will go to those new services. So how do you manage that gradual shift of traffic? Now, maybe some of you are looking at this photo in a rather confused manner. Um, what we have here is a strangler vine. So I'm making reference to the strangler pattern. Uh, we've been using BFFs as stranglers, meaning that we have placed them in front of our monolith. Uh, and slowly but surely, we're moving traffic away from the monolith and to our other services instead. So to make the strangler pattern work in our BFFs, uh, there's a few important things that we absolutely must have from the start. Number one, HTTP routing and proxying. Obviously, we need to know uh, when to direct traffic to our monolith and when to direct it to a new microservice. Number two is authentication. These new microservices uh, must have authenticated traffic since they're serving these user-facing APIs. But again, they don't want to do the authentication themselves. And lastly, and this is not really strangler pattern related, but we've also tackled live UIs. So this is maybe the most sort of controversial piece. Uh, I'm not aware of other companies you know, doing liveness through a BFF. But when you stop to think about it, I think there's probably some logic here. A BFF is basically a gateway and a transformer for all of the front end's traffic. So why should we limit it to sort of traditional HTTP request response pairs? Why is liveness traffic really any different? The underlying transport mechanism doesn't really matter, is what I would argue. Um, what's important is that the BFF is receiving and sending data for the specific front end that it is built for. So that could that traffic could go in any direction. It could use any protocol, uh, whether it's HTTP or WebSockets or even something like Thrift. So these three pieces of functionality will be the focus of this presentation. Um, and we'll have a more detailed look at each of them. This diagram depicts the sort of routing and proxying functionality. So at PD, uh, incoming requests go to different backends, whether they are the monolith or a new microservice. Now, this is pretty easy to understand, but perhaps not so easy to implement. 
So we're actually going to walk through how routing and proxying can be done with Akka HTTP. And like I said, uh, these microservices need to have authentication done for them. So in our system, the VFFs actually extract credentials uh, from an incoming request. Then they validate those credentials by calling an authentic authentication service. If the credentials are good, the BFF actually attaches a header to the request uh, with the authenticated data. So for example, a user ID might be included with the incoming uh, request after it leaves the BFF. The upstream service then just needs to read that header with the user ID data, and it doesn't need to do any authentication itself. Now certainly there's security things to think about here. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into much detail, but the header I'm talking about is typically cryptographically signed. So the upstream service can verify the signature of the header uh, to ensure that the BFF is the one who wrote it, and therefore the header can be trusted. Uh, when it comes to code, this is actually the most boring part. I'm not going to talk about it uh, beyond this. So the last piece of functionality um, that I will talk about in our BFFs is liveness. So we use Kafka pretty extensively at PD. Uh, it's pretty natural that we have a Kafka topic or many Kafka topics uh, where our services can publish uh, new information that might need to be pushed to a user interface. Uh, this topic is you know, basically a fire hose of change events uh, for many of the entities managed by the backend services. Our BFFs can consume from that topic, sort of transform the data if needed, and then push it to a front end through a WebSocket. This is sort of the second interesting bit of code that we had in our BFFs, and we'll see how Akka Streams gives you great building blocks to sort of get this done. Okay, so now hopefully everyone understands the BFF pattern and how we used it. Uh, we'll dig into, into some code now. Uh, and I've been saying proxying and routing up until now, but really the interesting piece is the proxy portion. The routing portion is just standard Akka HTTP stuff. You can read the docs. I'm not going to go over that too much. Uh, before we get started, let's uh, sort of zoom in on a single BFF. So it can receive requests uh, that, go, that go to any number of upstream services. The first question is, where are those services? Uh, if the BFF determines that a request sh should go to the monolith, what IP and port should the BFF forward the request to? This is kind of a standard problem. Uh, it has a standard answer, and that answer is service discovery. It can tell us what IP and port pairs uh, that the monolith is available at, for example. And because those service instances can go up and down, um, this address information is very dynamic. So you need a way to sort of update it without, um, you're updating it constantly without disrupting your BFF. And the way that we typically handle this uh, is that we abstract service discovery away from our application, uh, whether they're BFFs or otherwise. So in this diagram, you see HA proxy, um, which gets information from our service discovery mechanism. And you know, there's nothing really in particular um, that makes HAProxy good at this, but one thing it does have is that it can do hot reload of configuration, so that is useful. Anyway, uh, we're getting a bit into the weeds here, but the main point of this slide is that the BFF can talk to an upstream service by just talking to a local port um, provided by HAProxy. So for example, the monolith might be at port 3000, the microservice might be at port 4000. Okay, some code. So uh, let's say we want our incident API requests to go to the monolith at port 3000. Incident API requests all start with the same path, API slash incidents, and Akka HTTP has an easy way to capture all those requests uh, using the standard routing DSL. We then extract the request object from our, with the standard Akka directive and pass it to a proxy function along with the destination port. So if we think about what the proxy has to do, it's pretty simple. It accepts a request and a port, and it returns a future HTTP response, uh, which comes from the upstream service. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we just need to define the proxy function now. So here's what the proxy function might look like. Uh, we build an HTTP authority for our target, which is you know, just a fancy way of saying host and port. Um, 
And of course, since we're talking to that local HA proxy instance, our host is just going to be localhost, and the port is the one provided as an argument to the function. We then rebuild the URI of the incoming request, and we re rebuild the incoming request object itself. Notice here, you know, Akka has a very functional API. Uh, all the objects are immutable. We simply build new objects when we need to modify them. So we're at the point now where we have a request that's ready to be proxied to the upstream. The question is, how do we send it? Well, Akka HTTP also has a client. And crucially, uh, it uses the exact same immutable HTTP model as the server does. So we can simply pass our proxy request to the client and it returns a future HTTP response. This is exactly what we need. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I've glossed over a, a few things here, but this is pretty similar to the code that we actually use in production. Personally, I was very shocked at how easy this was. Uh, we just you know, wrote a proxy in a couple lines of code, and I felt like, surely, you know, we're doing something wrong here. A and we are. Uh, it it's pretty subtle, but this will compile and it will work for a while, um, but does anyone see what might be wrong with this? Nobody, okay. So, it has to do with this phrase right here, the streaming nature of request and response entities. Now, I've been told that I can be a very uh, literal person. I guess this slide is, is maybe pretty good evidence of that. Uh, anyway. So if you Google that phrase, you'll get a very good description from the Akka docs, which I highly recommend you read. But in essence, what this means is that the body of an HTTP request or response is not eagerly consumed into memory by Akka. Eagerly consuming is what many other clients and servers will do, so this feature can be a little bit surprising at first. What happens is, if an HTTP entity is not consumed by your code, Akka will interpret this as back pressure. It will actually stop the other side of the TCP connection from sending data. So in Akka HTTP, you must always consume an HTTP body or explicitly discard it. Now in our code, there is no explicit consuming or discarding. So what does this mean for our proxy? So to answer that question, we can step a little deeper into uh, Akka. And we look at what happens when we call the single re request method in our proxy code. Uh, that request is sent to a host connection pool. And the host connection pool is really a collection of TCP connections to our target upstream. Uh, each connection takes up what's called a slot. Whenever a request is submitted to the pool interface, one of two things can happen. Uh, number one, if there are free slots in the connection pool, the request is immediately sent to the slot for dispatch to the upstream. However, if all slots are busy with ongoing requests, the submitted request is just put into a ring buffer, so it can be uh, dispatched once one of these slots becomes free. So the symptom that we actually saw during our testing was an exception telling us that the ring buffer was full. And once we saw that exception, no more requests could be sent until we entirely restarted the BFF instance. So after a fair bit of digging, uh, we discovered that we were actually hitting this streaming entities problem. Over time, uh, we would have a few instances of a user client disconnecting from the BFF before consuming the HTTP entity. In practice, what this means is that the slot um, in the host connection pool is never freed up. It waits forever for something to consume the entity. So over time, the connection pool essentially leaked connections and slots. Eventually, it's going to leak all of them. And once there's no more available uh, connection slots, that ring buffer fills up very quickly. And of course, this is going to happen no matter how big you make the connection pool uh, or the buffer. So here's an illustration of that scenario. Uh, a user client makes a request to the BFF, which forwards the request to the upstream microservice. After some time, the microservice responds, and perhaps that response is big enough that it will be streamed rather than sent in one piece. So the case that we're not handling here is that the user client disconnects before it receives or consumes the response. This is maybe a corner case, but it will certainly happen. So let's think about how this works in the normal happy path. Uh, in our example code, there is no explicit consumption of the entity, and that's because ultimately the user client is the consumer of the streamed response. When the client tries to connect 
uh, or when the client tries to consume the entity, that demand is essentially proxied through our Akka HTTP server to the Akka HTTP client. So what's happening is that the user client consumes the entity from the upstream service through the BFF. But if that user client never consumes the entity and never signals the, the demand, then we have this problem where we start leaking connections. So how do we fix this? So here's a solution. Um, to be honest, I'm not entirely satisfied with it, but it does work very well. We just added a few lines of code at the bottom here. Um, in our proxy, we simply eagerly consume the HTTP entity. This frees up the connection slot as soon as possible, uh, even if the client disconnects or doesn't consume the body. And you know, naturally, consuming the entity is an asynchronous operation, so this code just flattens the features to return the expected future HTTP response. So not too bad still. Uh, we just added a few more lines. Who thinks that we should ship this to production? Any more problems? All right, well, we'll find out. There is, of course, another problem. It has to do with how Akka chooses a connection when it sends a request. Uh, it's not evenly distributed, so I'm going to call this connection bias. We can take another look at our earlier diagram, including HAProxy. One microservice likely has uh, many instances, and it's HAProxy that actually proxies our BFF's TCP connections to them. So a request incoming to the BFF will be proxied to one of those instances through HAProxy. But the question is, which instance will it go to? HAProxy is pretty dumb in this scenario. It's really only acting as a TCP proxy. If you make a TCP connection to it, it will make a corresponding TCP connection to one of the uh, microservice instances, usually based on an algorithm like round robin. It really has no knowledge of how the BFF is using those connections, and it doesn't really care. Um, so our application, on the other hand, didn't have code for choosing a connection either. So this means that we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper into Akka HTTP again. So we're back to our host connection pool diagram. Um, like I said earlier, when a request is submitted to the, to the pool, Akka will send it to an unused connection slot if there is one. Now, if we take into account HAProxy, that connection slot actually maps directly to a single instance of our microservice. These connections are persistent. Slot 1 is always going to go to service instance 1. Slot 2 is always going to go to service instance 2. That sounds OK. Um, but here's the question. What if there are multiple unused connection slots? How does Akka choose which slot to use? So the docs uh, don't actually say. I went spelunking in the Akka source code, and I found myself at this method. Now, personally, I had to stare at this for a while to figure out what was happening. But you know, we're all like great functional programming nerds for here, right? So um, I'll save you the trouble. It, it does a few things. But the important part is that it actually chooses the first unused slot, not random slot, not a least recently used. It's the first. And it actually says that explicitly in the comments that I conveniently cropped out. But so what does this mean for our BFF? It means that whenever slot 1 is unused, Akka will use it. If slot 1 is used but slot 2 isn't, slot 2 will be used. So you get the idea here. We have a bias to use the lower numbered slots. Now remember what I said before. One slot maps to a single microservice instance. So we're preferring to use instance 1 over instance 2 and instance 2 over instance 3. That doesn't sound super great. Um, but maybe it's not a huge problem, right? Because we're only using those connections when they're actually free. But what if that first microservice is really fast at returning a response? Well, then we're going to end up using it all the time, because it's always available. And when is a server really fast at returning a response? Yeah, one scenario is when the service is actually overloaded. If that microservice has a load balancer in front of it, like Nginx maybe, it might return 502 or 503 really quickly uh, when it's overloaded. And that's exactly what happened to us a few times. The first host in the HA proxy list would get overloaded, you know, maybe because it's getting a larger share of the requests than it should. It would start to return 502s really quickly. Then the connection slot was always free, 
So Akka would keep using that slot over and over and make the overloaded service even more unhappy. Is this Akka's fault? Should it be smarter about what connections it chooses? Should it somehow know that a particular host is overloaded and stop sending requests to it? I would actually argue no. Um, while you could implement these sorts of load balancing algorithms and health checks into Akka's uh, HTTP client, it's probably not the best place for it. You know, we already have software that will do these things very well for us, uh, for HTTP in particular. And of course, that already ex existing software is a real HTTP lo level load balancer like Nginx. Um, in our particular case, you know, HTTPproxy was very easily replaced with Nginx, so that's what we ended up doing. Um, and Nginx will actually load balance for each incoming request, not just a long-lived TCP connection. It can also do things like recognize a failure response, like a 502, and retry the request using a different upstream service. It can do health checks to determine if an upstream is actually healthy or not. If it's unhealthy, remove it from the rotation for a period of time. This stuff is really basic for a load balancer. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense to use it instead of trying to make Akka do things it's not really built to do. There's a third logo in the corner there, that's Envoy. Um, we see Nginx as a, as a sort of short-term fix to this problem. Uh, eventually, I think we'll move to something a little more suited to it, um, and that's like a service mesh type uh, solution like Envoy or Istio. I'm not gonna go into details about that, but look it up if you're curious. So I have to call out one caveat here, um, and that is that the connection pool implementation has changed in the newest version of Akka HTTP, which is 10.1. We're using 10.0 still, uh, and I don't have experience with the newer versions, so I'm not sure if you can have the exact same sorts of issues that we saw here, but you know, hopefully these examples have sort of armed you with uh, some knowledge to uh, what to look for if you find yourself in a similar situation. So that is the tale of Akka HTTP as a uh, routing proxy. Now with these problems out of the way and solved, it's time to talk about liveness and Akka streams. So to refresh your memory, uh, here's our liveness system di diagram. Our BFFs are consuming liveness events from Kafka and sending them via WebSockets to our various applications. Let's start with some consumption code. Uh, here we're using a library called Akka Streams Kafka. Um, it's now part of the Alpaca ecosystem, um, and it basically combines Akka Streams with the official uh, Kafka client. And uh, personally, I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's a great library to use. Um, so in Kafka, if you consume from a topic and that, to or sorry, in Kafka you consume from a topic and that topic is divided into partitions. We need to subscribe to all partitions in the topic because each BFF instance must have all of the liveness data. This is because an incoming uh, liveness WebSocket connection is randomly assigned to a BFF and could request any data at all. So that subscription is in the first few lines up here. Then we simply feed that subscription to a consumer along with some settings like IP uh, address to connect to, and what that gives us is a source of Kafka events, or Kafka records. Now, if any of you are unfamiliar with Akka Streams, you can sort of think of a source as a water faucet. Uh, it emits elements uh, like a Kafka record, just like a faucet emits drops of water. And so it's the way you get your data into your stream. It's your job as the programmer to provide functions to handle each element. So you can see that here that we are providing a map function which simply transforms the Kafka record uh, into its value. Kafka records are key value pairs and we don't particularly care about the key in this case, so we are uh, discarding it. So now to do something useful with this, with this source of Kafka messages. Uh, the messages are serialized as JSON, so we deserialize them to a case class. Then we send them to a broadcast hub, and we run the stream. So let's talk a little bit more about this broadcast hub, since it's really key to this strategy. A broadcast hub is essentially composed of two parts, a sink and a source. If a sink, or if a source is like a water faucet, a sink is like a bucket. It's how data from your stream gets to the outside world. So the sink half of the broadcast hub takes all of these deserialized liveness messages. And uh, when you run your stream, you get a materialized value. And that value is the other half, it's the source. 
every element that goes into the sink will actually be emitted by the corresponding source. But there's a very special feature here. And that feature is that the source can actually be included in as many streams as you like. And each of those streams will receive each element that the sink does. So this is why it's called a broadcast hub. It's a fan out mechanism uh, where a single element, like our liveness event, can be sent to many consumers. And this is, of course, very handy for us. A liveness event can be relevant for many different users, um, you know, all sharing the same account, for example, or a single user may have multiple applications open that should all get the same event. So back in the code, um, our liveness source is the source provided by the broadcast hub. The only thing left to do now is somehow filter our source so that we can get a stream of events that is specific to a given WebSocket connection. Obviously, we don't want to send every event in the system to you when you open your browser. This is not going to scale. It's a security problem. Uh, so we can define this function that if you give it an account ID, it filters the liveness source uh, to only events that have the same account ID. So what you end up with is a source of liveness events that is specific to a given account. Um, one thing to note here, uh, we're not doing any committing of Kafka offsets. If you sort of combine that with the default setting of uh, consuming the latest message in the topic, uh, this code will always get you the latest events uh, whenever it's run, and that's exactly what you want. So this is the Kafka consuming side of things. In production, again, there's a bit more code, but this is uh, most of the important concepts. So we still have to provide uh, these liveness events to our users. So let's have a look at the WebSocket side. Here we're back in uh, Akka HTTP land. After extracting a request, we can look for a request upgrade header, which is a request for a WebSocket. And if that header is present, we can get a source of liveness events specific to the requested account by calling the account source method that we defined in the previous slide. We're going to reserialize our events to a string. And then finally, we pass that source of account string events to the handle messages with sync source method. As you can see, uh, we're just ignoring any incoming events from the client side with the sync.ignore. So pretty simple stuff here. I'm omitting some complexity like authentication, but you get the idea. Who would ship this to production? Are there any problems? Well, yeah, uh, if you try this code out, and let's say you add a metric for events being consumed from Kafka, this is what you'll see, an empty graph. No events being consumed unless you actually connect a WebSocket client. So what's going on here? The idea is that the BFF should be consuming the Kafka events constantly. Um, new events are immediately sent to any connected clients. Well, to the docs we go, and there's this helpful bit describing a broadcast hub. There are no subscribers attached to this hub, and it will not drop any elements, but instead back pressure the upstream producer until subscribers arrive. So if we apply that to our situation, if there are no WebSocket clients connected, the broadcast hub will simply back pressure the Kafka consumer so that nothing will be consumed. This is not the situation we want. In theory, there should be you know, WebSocket connections all the time, but we don't want to rely on that to keep our Kafka consumer running. So there's a very easy solution to this. Uh, it's in the docs as well, actually. We're going to connect an, an ignoring sync to the broadcast hub. This ensures that there's always at least one subscriber, quote unquote, to the hub, so it won't back pressure when there's a no WebSocket clients connected. So with the addition of that one line of code, we get a better looking graph like this. Our Kafka consumer is always running, uh, even if we don't have a WebSocket client connected. So after all this, is Akka really a best friend forever for our BFFs? Let's take a look at some results. So uh, on our busiest BFF, we're serving 10,000 requests per minute per instance. We're also consuming 5,000 liveness events per minute from Kafka. And we're sending something like 15,000 liveness events per minute uh, per instance to our WebSocket clients. These are not huge numbers, um, certainly, but um, they're, they're sizable. And some people had a concern that, you know, with this pattern, we'd be introducing a lot of additional latency into our uh, request path. And so we were able to measure this, and that's only about 20 milliseconds. And that actually includes additional network hops 
and requests to the authentication service. And that request to the authentication service is actually the majority of, of uh, this time. And this code is pretty efficient. Um, you know, our busiest machines are running with a pretty low normalized system load of about 0 0.3. So just to illustrate that point, here's some graphs, you know, 10,000 requests per minute and all that while maintaining a pretty low system load. And these are not huge machines. They're like just four core standard uh, EC2 things. So in conclusion, uh, I would say that we're pretty happy with ACA on this project. Um, you probably noticed though that our journey had some bumps along the way and those bumps had a bit of a theme. So we were writing a very small amount of code because ACA provides these very powerful abstractions. But those abstractions sometimes worked in surprising ways, uh, especially in corner cases. That surprising behavior was not as surprising though once we had thoroughly read the documentation. The ACA docs are really great and they explain very well uh, what's happening under the hood of these you know, powerful abstractions, but you have to read them. Uh, having these powerful tools doesn't excuse you from knowing how they work. So I would really encourage you, you know, take the time to learn take the time to dig in if you find uh, problems. So if this code sounds interesting or useful to you, uh, I'm glad to say it's now open source, available on GitHub. Um, still working on like better docs and examples, but this is production ready code. This is what we're using to serve all of our traffic. Um, now if you've been paying attention, I said at the beginning, this talk was about BFS, not API gateways. And here I went and put API gateway in the name of the library. And the reason for that is simple. Um, these are really building blocks that are provided um, and they're pretty generic and they can be used to build a lot of different things. You can build an API gateway, you can build a BFF. It's really about how you put these things together and the code that you uh, put around them. So your application could be front end specific or it may not, it doesn't really matter. And actually a lot has happened uh, since I first wrote this talk in the spring. Um, we've tackled a number of other challenges including response transformation, API aggregation, um, you know, obviously we're still relying on ACA HTTP for the routing portion, uh, but the proxying code has a few more features. Um, in particular, it doesn't force you to have the sort of scheme where a particular upstream is available at a particular port. Authentication will obviously vary from usage to usage, so we've just sort of left in the hooks where you can put in your own logic. And unfortunately, the uh, live UI code is not yet included.